Let's keep talking about sugar diabetes, which we now know should be known as diabetes mellitus. Um, diabetes mellitus will be caused either by not enough the insulin, the hormone being produced by beta islet cells, or in some cases, there is plenty of insulin being produced, but something is wrong with the insulin receptor. Now, don't, don't get all rattled about that idea, right? Because we learned really early in this series of lectures that any given cell is only going to be able to respond to a hormone if it has the proper receptor protein. The insulin receptor is the name for the protein that interacts with the hormone insulin. And when that happens, second, second, second messengers, right? So remember that insulin is a water soluble or hydrophilic hormone. And since it's a hydrophilic hormone, it is going to need a little receptor on the surface of the cell. Because if being a water soluble hormone, it's not going to be able to enter the cell. Yeah, I know my cell's small compared to my receptor, but um, so this is gonna be my insulin and my insulin is gonna dock right there. And when my insulin docks, then that will cause this, which will cause that, which will cause that, which will cause the other second messengers. Okay. So we know that water soluble hormones like insulin, they act by second messengers, but I can't make that go away. There, okay. So there are two ways for this system to go wrong, two ways. One way would be if there is not enough insulin. If there's not enough insulin, well, then the cell's not going to get the message. But the other way things go wrong is there is plenty of insulin, but something's wrong with that receptor, right? So two ways that this thing can, this thing can go wrong. Now, we know the signs and symptoms of diabetes mellitus. Uh, cases of diabetes mellitus will always have high blood sugar. And when we say blood sugar, blood sugar is just the common terminology for high blood glucose. There is a specific sugar in our blood, and it is that monosaccharide glucose. High blood sugar, and high blood sugar is called hyperglycemia. Oh, I think I wrote this down at the end of the last video. Rings a bell, okay? Plus, so everyone with diabetes mellitus will have polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia, weight loss, but there are two different kinds of sugar diabetes, two different kinds of diabetes, diabetes insipidus, diabetes mellitus, and then, Diabetes mellitus, two subtypes. Type one, not enough insulin. Type two, plenty of insulin, something's wrong with the receptors, okay? Now, with type one diabetes, you really get an increased appetite and you get weight loss. And type one diabetes is more likely to be fatal quickly as well. So either there's not enough insulin, that's type one diabetes, or there's plenty of insulin, but something's wrong with the receptor, that is type two diabetes. Let's talk about type one diabetes first. Type one diabetes is considered an autoimmune condition, an autoimmune condition. Autoimmune means your own immune system is killing some of your cells. That's type one diabetes. You know, the white blood cells of your immune system, they are supposed to kill bacteria when they get into your body, or cancer cells if they happen. That's what your white blood cells are supposed to do. But with type one diabetes, a person's own immune system is making a terrible mistake and is killing what kind of pancreas cells, right? So it's a destruction of pancreas cells that cause type one diabetes. What kind of pancreas cells make insulin? 
Give you a second to look it up. Okay, good. Beta islet cells. The beta islet cells make insulin. And with type 1 diabetes, that person's own white blood cells are killing their own beta islet cells. No beta islet cells, no insulin being made. I got my flu shot today. Okay. Now, type 1 diabetes does have a genetic component, but we don't consider it a genetic condition. Okay. So yes, it's true that with a certain group of genes, those people are more likely to get type 1 diabetes. But it seems to be just something that happens in an interface with the right genetics and the right components of the environment. Type 1 diabetes is most often diagnosed in children. There is a type of type 1 diabetes that gets diagnosed in adults and currently is being called type 1.5, and we're not going to be talking about it, okay? We're just gonna talk about type one and type two. We're gonna talk more about type one diabetes in children in a little bit. Type two diabetes. Type two diabetes, there is a genetic component to it, a little bit stronger genetic component than with one type one diabetes, but, to put it politely, type 2 diabetes is largely a lifestyle issue. It's largely what we are doing to ourselves. And some of this stuff we know and understand, quite frankly, some of it we don't. We do know this. We do know that obesity is very likely to cause type 2 diabetes. Um, if there are is more than one family member um, in your extended family that has type two diabetes, it's really important for you to keep your weight down, right down into the healthy zone. Because if it runs in your family, it means you've got the genetics. And if you have the genetics, you really have to be careful about your lifestyle if you want to not get it, right? We also know this, a lack of exercise is important to this. And we think um, particularly important, um, maybe just the kind of chronic exercise that people in our grandparents' generation used to have. You know, people in your, maybe not your grandparents, maybe your great-grandparents. Um, your great-grandparents, they just walked around a lot. You know, they would maybe walk to the store and maybe as a part of their job, they were walking around a lot. Um, but even just that regular walking, the number of miles that a human used to walk even 50 years ago is much more than the number of miles a day that we walk now. Why? Because of what I'm doing right here. I got a computer. Usually I would be talking to you. And if I was talking to you, I had to walk from the parking lot to my car and then I'd be walking around while I'm lecturing and now I'm sitting, right? So a lack of exercise. And then there is diet and diet is a real baffler. Of course, we know that if you eat too much, you're more likely to get type two diabetes, but um, it also seems to be what we're eating. And this is very controversial. So I'm not even going any further into it because it's just very controversial. And I, I don't wanna, I don't want to imply something that's not proven yet. Let's go back and talk about genetics a little bit. You know, I told you, if you've got family members that have type 2 diabetes, then um, basically bummer for you. And I think that all of us, it is our instinct, our reflex, to think that if type 2 diabetes runs in our family, that there's something weak or bad about our genetics. But I would like to reassure you that scientists do not believe that the genetics for type two diabetes, that they are not bad genes and they are not weak genes. And the reason that we are working on this hypothesis is that we have found a handful of populations uh, who have got a tremendously high risk for type 2 diabetes. 
And all of those populations, the individuals that are here on the planet now, um, they are the descendants of people who survived multiple famines. So that means that if your family has got a history of type two diabetes, yes, you have the genetics for it, but that is because that genetics allowed your ancestors to be the ones that survived um, multiple famines. So come the zombie apocalypse and it's just September now in 2020, so we still have time. Um, come the zombie apocalypse, people with these type two diabetes genetics are much more likely to survive any famine that comes along than people with so-called good genes. So just because you've got a family history of type two diabetes, that doesn't mean weak genes, it's very strong genes. It's just strong genes if there's a famine around, very inconvenient genes in the modern society until another month goes by. <laughs> All right, now, I want to explain how insulin does its job because it's important and also it's on the next exam, okay? When insulin binds to the receptor protein, and notice this is the cell membrane, right? Phospholipid bilayer. When insulin, that's the little yellow dot, when it binds to the receptor in the phospholipid bilayer, it initiates second messengers. And for insulin, the result of those second messengers is to move glutes, G-L-U-T's. They're called glutes, not like your gluteus maximus, but glutes for glucose transporters, okay? When insulin binds to the insulin receptor, if both of those things are there and working right, it'll cause little packages of these guys these guys are the glucose transporters. It causes them to be put into the cell membrane. And when they're there in the cell membrane, glucose is allowed to enter the cell. Now, a glucose molecule cannot enter through the phospholipid bilayer. It requires facilitated diffusion. If there is no insulin around, then most of the cells of your body cannot let glucose into your cells. Now, what's going to happen? If glucose can't get into your cells, then your cell is very sad and very hungry. But glucose levels out here is going to be very, very high. You know, whenever people have got diabetes or whenever doctors are talking to patients about their diabetes, everyone, sorry, I don't know how to make this stop. Okay. <laughs> um, very distracting, sorry. When, uh, when pa doctors are talking to their patients about type two diabetes or type one diabetes, and when patients are thinking about it, what are we doing? We're constantly measuring blood sugar levels. We're constantly talking about blood sugar levels all the time, all the time, all the time, right? But what is really the important thing? The important thing, only a little bit, is the level of glucose in the blood. The most important thing is glucose is not getting into the cells, right? So uh, think about it this way. Let's say your next door neighbor is getting meals delivered every day uh, because she's locked up because of COVID, right? And so every day someone comes drops a meal off on the door, rings the doorbell, walks away. After uh, One day you look out there and you see that there are four days worth of meals sitting on the front porch. The meals would be the glucose. The fact that they're on the front porch would mean they're stacking up in the bloodstream, right? Are you worried about the meals being on the porch? No, I mean, maybe a little bit, but mostly you're worried because that person that's inside the house is not getting fed. That's the same way it is with both kinds of, of diabetes mellitus. Either there's no insulin, no one's ringing the doorbell, and since no one's ringing the doorbell, no one's coming to the door to let the glucose come inside the house, 
or there's plenty of insulin around. They're ringing the heck out of the doorbell, but the doorbell's broken, so no one comes to the door to let the glucose into the cell. Okay, we're going to pick up here at the beginning of the next video.